75. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 75 Patreon supporters away from achieving this goal and getting ever more closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all weekend warriors will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. And we have a special announcement. We have a new sponsor of the Patreon program, Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll receive 10% off your orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community. You'll be in the running for weekly Patreon giveaways, our monthly photo contest that we do every single month, and of course, members only content and so much more. If you would like to help Fishing the DMV grow bigger and better every single month to be part of a fantastic community that represents Virginia, Maryland, and the surrounding area, please check out the link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. I am so sorry that we're a little late tonight. Had a little bit of technical difficulty and we had a passionate conversation because tonight was the Black Bass Advisory Board meeting for the quarter. We only meet four times every six years, it feels like. It's so frustrating when it's like we have a couple more things we got to talk about, but it's like, but wait, we're going to talk about that in 2025. Um, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I think our next meeting is in July, but I did bring up today. It's like, could we meet like one more time just so it it feels like we can get to everything. So we are going to be talking about the Black Bass Advisory Board meeting a little bit. But then, of course, we have the legend on to talk about the tidal Potomac. It's springtime. It's getting into fishing season. And when it's not a small craft advisory, it's a really great place to fish. So without the moment ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Captain Steve, how are you doing tonight? I, you know, after you finish talking with, uh, you know, Conservation Director of the Year, uh joe love uh, uh, a biologist and we get a new guy on board uh martin gary's son ryan gary and then i see your wife boat flipping a fish and bouncing it all I over the and i haven't stopped laughing i'm sorry guys but i haven't stopped laughing since and uh but yeah it was a spirited meeting and uh you know it's it's amazing how even when you're speaking across a uh uh, through one of these type of zoom type meetings that something you say gets misinterpreted. Um, I think uh, we had that happen with me and I didn't, I didn't realize it, but uh, um, we don't meet enough and we should meet quite often because obviously, you know, there were several times I heard uh, Joe love say tonight that uh, gee whiz, I didn't expect us to be talking about that that much. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be like, uh, here it is, catch photo and release or catch a release. It's all the same thing. Well, no, it's not. And uh, who's doing this? Well, it's a kayak. So it goes on and on and on. And we do have a lot, a lot to talk about. And it's good to see finally we're getting everybody showing up at these meetings and participating and everybody bringing something to the table. And our table now is uh, is kind of full. We talked about a lot of a lot of good stuff. You're going to review that at some point with everybody? Yeah, I'm going to be trying to review that. We're going to have a special episode, guys, to, to kind of get into the meat and, meat and potatoes of it because there was a lot talked about, whether it is, you know, catch photo release tournaments, where that is going to be in the future of fishing. Um, I know people don't like Boyd, but I think they had some ideas that they were kind of forward thinking. They really were. Um, then you also talk about the different studies that were done in Texas and Florida and the forward facing sonar study. I mean, that if there's a one thing I wanted to hit on just because I think pe generally the public would think this is interesting was I think it's like only a 10% increase in fish catching, generically speaking, with forward facing sonar. Um, that's fascinating yeah, to me. The difference is that forward-facing sonar is making heroes out of guys that have two years, three years fishing experience mm -hmm. from the college level till they they get out and all of a sudden they're, they're 19 years old and you're winning a Bassmaster tournament. Uh, forward-facing sonar is having a bigger impact there than I think it's that it's having on your smaller tournaments or, or even just fishing in general. I, and I'm not yeah. sure what that stat was where they just said they said there's really no difference in the catch rate between those who use it and those who don't 
It wasn't uh, identified whether that was tournaments they were talking about or whether it was the weekend angler going crappie fishing because yes. it was the crappie fishing that, that really, when I first wrote about forward-facing sonar about six years ago, the thing I was concerned about was, was crappie fishing. I was hearing from a lot of crappie anglers, well, they're going to wipe them all out. Well, I, I still see pictures of crappie out there. So there, there are a few left. Uh, so we don't know. And there's going to have to be a lot uh studied about this that was one of the things i wanted to bring up at the meeting that we should every every meeting we should talk about it uh and until we get the right questions i mean when you go from uh randy blockett's point of view all the way back to where everybody thinks it's the greatest thing and and they love it and and oh it's good that the the older guys can't figure it out they can figure it out that the difference between the younger guys and the older guys is the the younger guys are dependent on forward-facing sonar. The older guys are resisting it and not going all in. When they go all in, they're going to figure it out, and bass, mm. pro bass fishing is going to be the most boring it's ever been because everybody will be doing it, and it'll all be offshore fishing. You won't have guys punching mats or throwing frogs. It'll, you know, they'll all. I talked to Ishman Rowe back in December, and I said, uh, I said, Do you, are you changing anything because of forward-facing sonar? He goes, no, I'll still fish shallow, and I'll still fish for the fish I know how to catch. Well, that's going to have to change because these guys are finishing in the bottom part of uh, the standings now as we see tournaments going. Yeah, 100%. And then, guys, as always with Monday Night Live, ask a question. I'll pick it. I'll win a prize. It's how this works. I have a bunch of gift cards I want to give away tonight. This is not just going to become like last week, um, the, an, uh, a, a forward-facing sonar hot topic. It's just very interesting when you look analytically. And this is my last point on this for people that are listening. And then if the, if the conversation wants to go there again, we shall. But it really comes down to the one percenters when it comes to how, how this technology affects it. So if you put an aluminum bat in generally any adult's hand, He's only going to be able to hit so well. But you put that in the four hitter for the Yankees, there's going to be a significant jump. And I think that's what happens is because of social media now, and I'm just talking from a, from a high level, if you're watching on your couch and you watch the guys during the classic, you think, oh, clearly I can go out there and have that success with forward-facing sonar. And I think that's the disconnect. It's like, no, you can't necessarily, but they can because they are those that good of an angler. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I'll add one thing. The first time uh, I actually used forward-facing sonar was with Troy Morrow, and he was back then. Nobody was sponsored by Garmin. I mean, Garmin was mm. like you know back in the the eighties and nineties. We had Garmin, Lowrance, Hummerbird, or Eagle was Lowrance, and and that's what we used. And then Garmin kind of disappeared from from bass fishing. And Troy Morrow was sponsored by Garmin, and he had it, and he was like, "Hey, uh, look at this," you know. And I'm like. Uh, Troy, you just came in the top 10 in three, three Potomac River tournaments, uh, BFL, Strens, and I think another one. How did you do that? And they were all like within a month and a half, two months. He spent two months up here, and he did real well. He said, it's this thing, this forward-facing sonar. So he showed it to me. He goes, all right, there's a fish. Cast to it. And I go, well, how? where am I casting to? Oh, it's 22 feet away. I go, I don't know how to cast 22 feet. I, that's not in my, that's not, I could cast to the teacup in that 22 foot, but I can't, I, you know, so that was the first thing I had to learn. And I think once again, once guys learn this, it's going to be a whole different ball game, but you are so right. It doesn't make you a better fisherman. Uh, you still have to have skills and you still have to have the desire and, and the, the love to get out there and stand in the boat. Part of that introduction that you do every every show where the, the guy's explaining fishing you got to have that you know yep. you got to you know go to robert montgomery and read his book why we fish you know we all have different reasons why we fish and it's it you know for a lot of people it is forward-facing sonar some of them it's not uh but uh you know it it will it will find its way what are your thoughts? And then again, guys, as always, we're going to be doing an episode that's going to be more uh, going into the weeds with this stuff. But catch wave release, catch photo release, I feel like got bad stigma because of the controversy around Major League Fishing. When in general, Bass has done it for a while when it comes to going to like the, you know, the Texas Big Bash back in the day. They go to like Fork. It's always been a part of the zeitgeist. Is there a place for that in fishing, or do you think that's just going to become the future of fishing? You mean a place for catch, photo, and release? Yeah, because everyone is so... Could, you know, that's a very odd way to ask that question. Yeah. I think I understand you, though. Uh, it, it, 
it probably will end up being the way we fish um, because the, the, the technology to, to cut back on delayed mortality and, and dead fish at tournaments. I mean, we heard some numbers tonight that were staggering 43% delayed mortality fish dying, you know, always like, Hey, I released the fish will swam away. Well, they're not dying when they're alive, when you let them go, but they're dying up at a fast rate, two to five days, they're dead. Um, and there's no technology that we have today. That's going to get a boat with a good enough live well to transport fish around, culling here and there, bouncing the fish around on rough boat rides, coming back, putting them in a plastic bag, dragging them down the parking lot, putting them in a plastic tub, draining all the water out of it, putting it on a scale, holding it up for pictures, putting it back in a bag with some water, taking it down the end of a hot dock in, in a marina and letting it go. There are a lot of things you could do. You could have a release boat. You could have uh, like old uh, FLW used to have those tanks that basically uh, had their aerated tanks and they were swimming around. They weighed the fish while they were in water. That was that was way ahead of its time. But all of those things that that you should have and the things that we don't know about that are out there that eventually will be developed that we have to have to make sure that we cut that 40 percent down to zero. Um, is going to predicate that we will be fishing the catch way or catch photo and release. And I'm seeing smaller clubs do this, especially during those, those summer months. I mean, that 40% was a, a number from the summer months. And uh, that's you, shocking. You know, yeah, that, you know, I've, I tell everybody it's about an average of 20% delayed mortality. And they go, how's that? And I go, well, you take summer. You know, and that spread that out, average that out, you know, and uh, you're going to have, you know, when when all the other tournaments were 10 percent, you know, there's your there's your 20 percent delayed mortality. So it will be a thing. And I and I don't think at least I haven't gotten any kind of negative feelings from Major League Fishing about the catch, weigh and release. I read a lot. Of, of posts where I'm tired of watching, you know, these guys catching, you know, one pound bass and all that. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's bad. I think, you know, when we're talking about growing the sport, uh, you want to get people out there. Hey, someone catch. I, and I, I do this all the time. I can I go out fishing with clients. They catch a fish and they pull it out. It's a 12 inch fish. And they go, Hey, what do you know? I got a five pounder. Okay. You got a five pounder, you know, I mean, that's how I get paid. Right. So, you know, it, everybody gets exciting. And that's why, you know, I've told people I love fishing with women because they get excited on every single fish and they really appreciate it. They appreciate the time away from all the stuff they have to do. And they get out there and they catch a fish and they appreciate it. Or guys, you know, kind of like, like your wife, just throwing the fish back in the water. Uh, um, I fished with Japanese anglers for a long time, uh, businessmen. In fact, when I started my guide business, uh, there, there, were other, there were other guide services out there I was competing with. So I, I wanted to create my own market. So I went to the Japanese embassy and I said, hey, bass fishing. I knew they bass fish. Well, they started coming out. Every fish they caught, they treated it like it was like their baby. I mm -hmm. mean, they... They, they, nobody boat flipped them. They, they reached down, they cradled the fish. They, they looked at it. Oh, beautiful fish. And then they let it slowly go in the water. Um, and we need to get that mentality back. And I think part of that is going to be catch photo and release because it's, uh, there's no way that we can protect these fish. And we, I think at the, the meeting we had uh, tonight, we were talking about, uh, you know, putting oxygen systems in the boats and ice and all this stuff. And it's not an exact science in that fish. And, you know, they never mentioned why we, uh, we, we, you know, refill our, our, our live wells during the day. We drain them out and refill them because there's, there's stuff that the fish uh, secrete that, yeah. you know, urine and everything else that they're living in. You need to get new water in there, no matter how cool it is or how well it's oxygenated. And it's interesting because I'm glad you brought that up at the live wells because I brought this up during the study that they did is I think you need to, to take the study and striate it between elites, BFLs, Toyota series, because mm -hmm. and, and then one of the people in the meeting today, everyone was like, oh, you think that makes a difference? And it's like. I yeah. think it would. I, I really would yeah. be interesting to see, like, do the elites take better care of fish than the Thursday nighters? And it's anecdotal, but I would I would assume it's the elites. But having data points to back that up, because, again, like, yeah, you got the Ikea boat that's two hundred thousand dollars and it'll massage the fish for you and adjust the water temperature. Like, well, that's great. But 
I can't afford that boat. And so is it a technology thing where because people are running boats that are like from the Cold War, it doesn't have the live well systems in place that would benefit fish, you know, safety? I, I don't know. I think all that stuff is really interesting. Um, we got Jared. Jared has asked a couple of questions. Jared, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. This one isn't a question, but this is a statement. Um, I'm from MS and we have a bad problem back home with tournaments coming through and decimating lakes because of that reason. It, it, and he, I think the mission, I think Michigan was mentioned in the study that they had like over what a thousand tournaments a year yeah, or something. Well, I think like it was that. more than that. And 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 I was surprised that we only have like 300 or so in, in Maryland. Uh, those are permitted tournaments, but still thousands of, of tournaments up in Michigan. Um, and I think Bassmasters has been going there. What happens is when Bassmasters goes to a lake, then all of a sudden everybody, it's like advertising. I mean, these tournament organizations, that's how they sell it to these localities to pay them to come there. They go, hey, you're going to get a lot more tourism out of this, so more people show up. I can relate to that. Uh, in my guide business, um, uh, I, I know you're from Mississippi, but I didn't catch your name. But uh, in my guide business, I quit fishing Saturdays and Sundays. And I would tell people, do you want to fish the best three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Because Friday tournaments are going to be practicing. Saturday, they're going to be on the water and they don't care that you're fishing for fun or fishing with your kid or fishing with your dad. They don't care. They're going to come in. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Some of the top level pros are really, really good at it. They just show you a real sad face when you're fishing in the spot that they want to fish. And, uh, you know, and it gets so crowded out there. Now, you also have to wonder what kind of impact that has on the fishery. Uh, I also anecdotally, uh, you know, day after a, a, a tournament, I had trouble. I mean, the water was beat up. The grass beds were all, you know, you know, plowed through and, you know, with props and everything like that. So I started doing what other people did. Some of the best fishing I ever had was when the, uh, I think it was FLW launched out of National Harbor and they released thousands of fish in National Harbor. Hmm. And I went there every day and caught them. I would, I actually, it was so good. It's so easy. I told my clients, look, here's the deal. As soon as everybody catches five fish, as we get 15 fish in the boat, we run across the river and let them go in, in uh, Bellhaven Cove. And so we took them from one and took them over there. And, uh, and I mean, that was it. We didn't call anything. We just took them all. You know, it might have taken 15, 20 minutes to get, get uh, you know, a, a limit of fish for each guy. And uh, we would take them over and do that. But, yeah, I feel your pain. Um, and I don't know what to do about it because the waterways that you pay tax money for, um, you can't get to the boat ramp because it's full of tournament people. I know in Maryland, uh, what that was one of the reasons that tournaments are, are registered uh, because uh, they now, you can tell you if you're getting ready to go fish on Saturday, you can look online and see where the tournaments are, where they're launching from. So at least you can find a place to park. But yeah, it, it makes, makes it tough. And I don't know that there are enough studies out there specifically on the morning after what happens the day after a, a tournament, you know, leaves town, you know, what does it do to the fishery? Yeah. And I don't think that's Pandora's box. Cause I already know a question we're going to get in the comment section. It's like, so you saying they should outlaw tournaments? No, because I think no, that's going to create more issues. Yeah. It's no. that's yeah. That, it's not that it's just, it is what it is. It's a problem that has to kind of be dealt with at some point. Um, the other thing that came up and was interesting, I was guest started on another podcast um, since I'm on the board and I talk about this area and they, and they were talking about, well, why don't you just stock a lot of these title places? And something that's come up a, a bunch and Odin Kirk's talk about this is saltwater intrusion. And it's like, if you stock a place like Nanjamoin, but you stop mm -hmm. and you stop having tournaments, eventually there won't be fish there anymore because people will come in, pick them up and move them. And they're just not coming back to those areas. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, if there's no reason for them to be there and, and we hear the one word when you talk about fisheries management and fisheries, uh, you know, the health and all that kind of thing, it comes down to one word and that's habitat. Uh, habitat is that saltwater intrusion. Habitat is, uh, are the SAVs there, uh, subaquatic vegetation. Is that there? Is there, is there cover? Is there a reason for them to be there? If not, you're putting them in, anglers are taking them out or they're just moving and i remember when nanjamoy was was really good had a lot of grass growing everywhere in nanjamoy and uh they it was always full of bass and we got a comment here on instagram again uh streamyard will not let me share those comments i'll just re read it out from triple threat fed okay what are your recommendations about what can be done um 
Uh, we are just talking about also, so we both are on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland. So when the state of Maryland makes decisions on the fishing in these waters, we get to have these meetings. Again, it's quarterly to just talk about some of the things that are coming up potentially for legislative issues or how we can fix things. So w when we're talking about this, I, I'm kind of talking from the fact like this is what's being brought up and this is the issue. I don't know the the how this can be fixed, a lot of these problems, because I'm not that smart. I don't know what the right course of action is. I think maybe a hybrid tournament in the future, I think, is the best where everyone can be happy. Because I get like there are people on the extremes where it's just five fish only or catch photo release. I think the Lake Fork style is probably where you can get people kind of like you can still bring in your nice big one to show off to Earl and your friends and take your pictures and, and you put one back and it does cut down on it. But I, I, I don't know. And then Joe also has this in the comment section uh, on Facebook. How do you find out the damage of bringing fish to the dock? How does one go about that study? That is a really good question. Well, a lot of it is, is visual. And they, when they, they visit the, the boat ramp a day or two or three after a tournament and they see dead fish and they, a lot of times the anglers or uh, natural resources people go out and actually count those. After that, then, then it's all, you know, statistical mumbo jumbo where they say, okay, we, we were able to survey three tournaments in July when the water temperature was 90 degrees and we had an estimated 40% uh, delayed mortality. So that means every time the water gets to be 80 or 90 degrees, we're going to have 40% delayed mortality. And, uh, and they do a lot of studies on this. And the studies, unfortunately, are post-mortem. I mean, they're, you got to have dead fish uh, to count. And they unfortunately have dead fish. Uh, which is one of the reasons too. And I I thought this was kind of sneaky that the uh, the tournaments had release boats, so it would be very unsavory for 200 boats to go out fishing with uh, you know 200 uh, boats with two people on the boat. You're you're talking 400 times five fish at you know 2,000 fish that are caught on on a day of a tournament, and then the tournament goes for two or three days. So you could be weighing in about maybe three or four thousand fish. They have release boats that eliminates any evidence of delayed mortality. And a lot of people, maybe even me, might have questioned the real motive of, of a release boat, of taking these fish, taking them out just far enough away so that if and when they do die, there's no evidence. There's no evidence at all. So I remember that Maryland did a, a study with FLW. They, they penned up. They made these pens. They put some shocked bass into a pen and then they took some tournament release fish and put them in a pen. And unfortunately, because it's tidal, the water changed, you know, with tide going out, trapped some of the fish and, and they all died. So there have been attempts to do studies on, on delayed mortality. And that would be the way to do it would be to take fish that were in a tournament, put them in a pen and let them sit there for five days and then go back and, and count them, see how many you have. But you run the risk of, of killing them when they probably wouldn't have died in the first place. Yeah. And Joe, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Uh, as always guys, if you want a gift card, message me, Instagram, Facebook, or email me fishing, the DMV at gmail.com. We got a, we got a bunch of questions on this topic here. So we're going to, I'm going to hit both these real quick. I'm going to say a part of it, which is inter news. Uh, we are wondering if damage is being done by tournament fishing. Then we state examples of how it, it does damage fisheries. Then we want a study as though our lying eyes can't see what's going on. Uh, yeah. He adds to it. Uh, we don't need studies. We need a fishing community that has protecting and growing the fisheries as its top priority, not growing the sport. Mm -hmm. One one thing I want to add to all this, because I think we, we don't see the forest of the trees here. When Forrest Wood had this crazy idea of what if we put the fish back, all these fish that are being put in a live well, and this is just for context, everyone. These are fish that the state deems you can keep to go put in your live well to either consume or fish in a fishing tournament. If we go back 40 years before catch, way, catch, and, catch and release tournaments were a thing, all those fish would have a 100% mortality rate because they were killed. So when we yeah. are stating that, okay, there's a 40% mortality rate, that is still a thousand times better than where it was beforehand when all of them were killed. Just, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I just want everyone, because I feel like we forget the past. 
it's still remarkably better that we are doing it this well. Now, I feel like we forget the past that like, oh, no, it, this is a terrible number. Blah, blah. It's not like what it used to be. So just just some context there. OK, and backing up a little bit more, I'll I'll add this that, you know, when Ray Scott did all that, he had no idea how it would have grown. Yeah. So fisheries managers have to keep up with with everything they can. And one of the things that they they do is they set a limit. They say, Tom can go out. I can go out with Tom. We could catch five bass a piece, take them home and cook them. And they count that into their calculations for any type of fishery management uh, changes that they make, whether it's creel limits or seasons or any kind of restrictions at all. So while you may feel the fishing has gotten worse, uh, it, it, and indeed it may have, uh, Right now, that's the only tech, uh, technique they can use. They have to rely on studies. They can't just uh, – because they're scientists. These guys are scientists. Everything is – you know, got to have a study. When, when I say it's very obvious that when you drag a hulsane net that's 10 feet deep through grass beds that are 3 feet deep, that you're going to rip up the grass. Well, I mean, that's common sense. I mean, you, we see it. Mm -hmm. Our lion eyes, as you say, we see that. But they're scientists. They have to do a study to make sure that that is totally validated because that's, that's how they're wired. That's how they work. And uh, so you just have to kind of watch, keep pressure, join, you know, like, like Thomas and I have, I've been serving on committees and commissions in Maryland for 20 years, over 20 years. And, you know, and I'm not, I'm not the most liked by the Maryland DNR because I raise questions. I ask, I, I say, Whoa, no, no. How, how is a commercial fisherman going to, going to take bass off of a bed before they all run a hall say net through there. Tell me, I don't know. Show me that. And it's like, well, yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah. Right. But, uh, we stay on top of that. Yeah, uh, we really do. And then, so, uh, do you got Brandon here? Uh, so we just going to keep ahead of the NVKBA circuit this season, not complaining, just asking, all right, if you're asking why we're doing the Potomac now, it's because usually it, it follows a tea leaves. You usually start on lakes in the area. And then when the weather becomes safer, we go to the Potomac. It just happened that this is ahead of that tournament series. Uh, there's another question from Brandon here to partner him up. This obviously isn't just a local issue. What are other DNRs doing to solve the same problem? Do depths talk across the States? So, I'll break this here. I just got permission from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. I am going to have John Odenkirk and three other members to do the Virginia Tidal Water Summary Part 2 next Monday. It'll be live streamed. It'll be here, same place. I'm going to have three people on from Virginia to live broadcast, and I'll ask him that exact question because it's a good question probably for those people. I, I asked that question. Uh, <laughs> well, I asked it, I asked it at every meeting. And finally, I, I, they got together right before COVID. It was amazing. So the first, the first objection was, well, Virginia, they do their surveys like this. And we do ours like this. And D.C. does theirs like this. You had three jurisdictions on the Potomac River, and they weren't talking to each other. So I got them to talk to each other. And they did. And they came up with... Again, this was right before COVID. It's unfortunate. Maybe you bring up a good point. We should probably revisit this and get Maryland back on board with this, uh, with the with the new uh, black bass manager. They all got together and they said, well, we'll instead of you doing this and us doing this and someone else doing this, we'll try to do this mm -hmm. and we'll we'll work on we'll work on some uh, uh, methodology that we can all live with and we'll use that as a standard. So, yeah, they started to work together. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, you know, uh, I guess flies uh, in the soup was uh, a PRFC decided that they were going to change crappie regulations. OK, so if you caught if you were Virginia, whatever their limit was, let's say it was 20. I think that was probably right. But the PRFC, without talking to anybody, decided ours is 12. I don't like because the, the, the director of, of the or the. Uh, uh, chairman of the PRFC actually said this, and he used to be our chairman too, and we did not get along. But he actually said, I was walking down a dock and I saw people keeping too many crappie and I thought I would do something about it. Well, the something he did about it, if, if you caught your 20 crappie that were legal in Virginia in Occoquan, went back out in the river to circle around to go to Leesylvania, as soon as you crossed into PRFC waters, you could have been ticketed. So 
you know, we do have to have cooperation. Everybody has to be on the same page. The, the fish, you know, they don't know boundary lines and the fish do move around a bit. And we've got some very smart biologists and they have a lot of unique data. And if they would share it, we'd learn a whole lot more. And then again, guys, yeah, keep the questions coming. I, like I said, I will start advertising this, but we will be having a, uh, I will be having everyone on from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. They'll be live streamed next Monday. So please save some of these questions for them as well. Um, we got a fishing no, Don't question. save it for them. So ask them, ask them now. Yeah, or, those or, guys, or, or, yeah. you know, they start talking, you won't understand what they're saying anyway. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, that's why I've got Steve here. Jared, Mark, Jared, again, you just want to give Carter Jake's bait and tackle from earlier. Make sure you reach out to me so you can get that Instagram, Facebook, or uh, gmail.com. Uh, we are new to the Alexander area. What are the good local fisheries to start at? I usually like to target white perch, crappie, and largemouth. Hmm. Okay, well, do you have a boat? Okay, if you have a boat, there are a lot of places you can go. Uh, if you like, if you have a small boat, uh, Burke Lake is a really good lake to, to go to. Uh, if you have a bigger boat, of course, the Potomac River, Lake Anna are great places to go to. Within all of... What's that? Fountainhead. Yeah, Fountainhead. Within all of these uh, fisheries, there are locations uh, on the Potomac. Uh, for instance, if you go to Occoquan, it's a really good crappie area where you can go there. If you go further north uh, into D.C., you might catch smallmouth. Uh, catfish uh, pretty much up and down the river. Uh, we've got some pretty good size uh, blue cats, and, uh, and uh, I guess there's another catfish that they target too. But a uh, lot, of, lot of good fish around there from the bank. Uh, Jones Point is really good. That's uh, but it requires a DC license. It's right near the the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and you can fish for catfish there. If you want to fish for bass from the bank, Potomac's not really that easy. But there is a little secret spot called Four Mile Run. Yeah. Four Mile Run is a uh, warm water discharge uh, from a, a, a treatment plant in Alexandria. It's I call it an aquarium because it's usually clear. There are really no obstructions, maybe some bridge pilings to, to work on. Um, and I'll also give you another little pointer about four mile run. Back a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, they used to have a lot of flooding through there. So what they did was they, they changed the shoreline. They put riprap and, and they also unrolled chain link. And that was to keep the shoreline from, from eroding away. So that chain link holds a lot of um, a lot of uh, crayfish and a lot of bait fish. And those areas are really good to fish, but they're very snaggy. So try that, try four mile run. Um, and a lot of other small ponds around the area. You can, you can probably Google them. I, I think I've seen you uh, uh, on some of the uh, Northern mm -hmm. Virginia fishing pages. So um, feel free to reach out to me uh, on those pages or uh, anybody else that's on those pages. Everyone up here is pretty friendly. It's just, they won't tell you everything true yeah and facebook is a good there's a ton of really good groups out there boss that can help you out there um let's see we got a couple we got a, some great ones we got first cast first fish uh today there are considerably more tournaments being fished even at 40 percent mortality i would assume more fish are dying today than back then due to the growth of the sport and the money yeah yeah it's so weird and, and this is i'm i'm not the one to speak on this but when you look at the put and take trout guys and, and even the trout streams and stuff, there's ways that even though you get more fishing pressure, you can keep these fisheries sustainable. So I, I just don't like to be too pessimistic with the chat guys. Um, and to be like, well, everything's just going to die. It's just an evolution. It's an evolution like everything else. And I, and I'm, I'm, I think we'll figure it out at some point. All right. So my takes a little bit different. Than this. So <laughs> we have the, the fish populations are fine. We have fish. What we don't have is big fish. If you're a bass fisherman, you're in a tournament, you're not bringing back four 12 inch fish. You're going to be back, trying to bring back, you know, four 15, uh, five 15 inch fish. You want to bring back the biggest fish on the, on the lake. So that's what you're bringing back. Those are the fish that are more susceptible to, uh, to, you know, dying in your live wells or dying at, you know, uh, delayed mortality. So these guys are, everyone's catching fish. There's still plenty of fish, but we're losing that bigger part of the population, the heavier fish. And it's almost like, you know, a, a triangle, I guess the base of the triangle, that's your one year old fish. And then the population gets smaller with the two year old, three year old, four year old, five year old, six year old fish to where it's a very, very small population. But those are the ones that are getting the most pressure yeah. and uh, from tournament pressure. And that, that is affecting. So I tell tournament guys, I go, look, think about this when you're out there fishing, see if you can take better care of your fish. 
if I ever see anybody on, and Guggen, they had an ad and it's running right now on Facebook and they show a guy boat flipping a bass and bouncing all over the carpet. And I always say the same thing. It's not good for the fish to lay them on the carpet. That's all I say. And depends on how the attacks go. If they're, if they're vicious, then I usually just walk away. But if they're asking why, then I explain to them that, you know, they have a slime coat and you start to remove that. This all goes to fish care. So if you're in a tournament and, and you really care about your fishery, don't boat flip those fish. They are the biggest fish uh, in, the, in the river and you're going to spoil, spoil the river for somebody else to catch a nice one. Yeah. And then for everybody that's listening on Twitter and Instagram, if you switch over to YouTube or Facebook, you can go back in time. YouTube is great for this and you can drag back and, and you can really get the summary of everything. But to summarize, we are just talking about the Black Bass Advisory Board that we are a part of for Maryland. And we're talking about really their thoughts on where we should go with tournaments. And, you know, we broke the story back in February when Pennsylvania really reenacted that they're banning tournaments for a certain time of the year. And I said then that this is a domino effect. This is the canary in the coal mine. One is doing this and more states are going to follow. And it kind of sounds like I wasn't wrong about that. There are a lot of states behind the scenes that are talking about what is the potential of us doing some kind of catch way or catch photo release format. Again, you know, that's not going to be like the whole emphasis of this whole show. Uh, we got Adrian uh, up on Instagram. So what what have they said about the lack of grass growing north? This is something that's important because no matter what, it comes down to habitat. And when we talk about we're losing this upper percent of our fish population, I really want to come back to the SAV population and how these lakes are getting older. A lot of these lakes, depend. I think it's always a lake by lake basis. They're evolving into something different. They're getting clearer. A lot of that wood is starting to completely disappear out of it. And if you don't have SAV and things like that, it can be an issue. If you look at Fountainhead right now, Fountainhead, it takes 40 pounds to win. If you're not catching 40 pounds, you're not winning out of there, even though that thing gets pressure. But the difference is it's got a ton of shad in it. It's got an insane amount of shad and it's got tons of cover. So it, it's such a hard, it's not easy. There's so many different things to balance to get these good fisheries. Yeah. So I fish a lot in that upper end of the Potomac, uh, basically from Doe Creek all the way up to D.C., and there used to be a big grass flat above and below the Wilson Bridge. And for those who've been around here for a long time, you remember driving over, it looked like a golf course. There was so much grass growing on, on the above the bridge and below the bridge. The channel, the true channel ran up the Virginia side and there was a false channel that ran up the, the Maryland side. So it was this big filter in the river. It was the most unique spot on the whole river where all the muddy water would come down uh, this time of the year. And it would run through that grass and it would get filtered and the water would get clearer. So the grass we're talking about primarily that we like to fish is called milfoil. Milfoil grows very long stalks. It grows, you know, it tries to reach the sun and it grows in, in clumps. And those are really, really good to, to fish. But the problem is they need that sunlight to get not only get started, but to maintain their growth. They've got to have a lot of sunlight without that big filter up north. It was like dominoes. We saw it. It was like, okay, first there's no there's no grass there. Well, then there's no grass in uh, in Smoot Bay or National Harbor, what you want to call it. Then that whole bank all the way down to Broad Creek, then that grass disappeared. I'm just doing the Maryland side first. Same thing happened on the Virginia side. Then you go into Broad Creek, and guess what? The grass there started to go away, still hasn't come back. Then you go to Swan Creek, and it didn't come back. And you go to Piscataway, and it's just starting to come back from time to time. On the Virginia side, it was the same way. Bellhaven Cove, full of grass. And then you go further south, and you get to, to Mount Vernon. That, that whole area along the parkway was full of grass. Little Hunting Creek, full of grass. Doe Creek, full of grass. Pohick Bay, everything was full of grass. But when you lose that big filter, and that grass doesn't get a chance to really get growing, and stay growing through the you know until it clears up in June, then it's it's going to disappear. And a lot of that was the turbidity, I think. And again, this is where we talked about the science and how they you need a study. Um, there were all kinds of theories. Why did we lose it? Let's see what was going on then. Oh, I know. They were building a new Woodrow Wilson bridge mm -hmm. 24 hours a day, running barges all the way back and forth. They they actually dug a channel 
below the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, uh, the new one, so they could go back and forth. And then they had these big concrete things. Oh, where did they get those? They went into Smoot Bay where they built a concrete facility so they would pour the, the concrete uh, forms and then they'd come back out, put them in, come back, go back and forth, back and forth, almost 24 hours a day. There was grass growing when they broke ground that November, there was grass growing there. The next season, there was grass. And then after that, nothing. Star grass occasionally, and that was some grass. That's a native grass, and um, it, it was planted by D.C., up in D.C., and it kind of spread, but then it, it died back. It needs light. Plants yeah. need light. And without without light, we can't see Thomas. And uh, we can't. Yeah, there he goes again. I My wife is doing that to you. She doesn't want you to have this. Show. I can tell. Uh, yeah. But so without without the big grass flat that we had there, and I don't know how that's ever going to come back because we really don't have it. I became really good at not only finding but fishing hardcover in the summertime where most people were were still going, I'll just go to a grass bed where 30 or 40 of my close friends will be there, you know, sharing the same spot. I had I had spots to myself that I will sell those GPS coordinates <laughs> to the highest bidder. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And that's something that I cannot wait for having Odenkirk back on to talk about that next week, because it's like the hydrilla thing in so many places where, you know, if you guys don't know, hydrilla is... It, most DNR people do not like hydrilla. The perk of hydrilla is it'll basically grow anywhere when other grasses won't. But to getting that whole topic is basically when you have grass in a estuary, fishery, whatever, it makes it better. And it's that weird chicken or the egg thing. Like it'll clean the water, but once the grass is gone and the water is too dirty, the grass can't grow at all. And so what you get these situations where you need the water to get clean enough for the grass to start growing. And once the grass actually starts growing, it'll keep the water clean. But I, I and I don't know what what you need. Is it mean you just need to have a couple of dry years where it's not really turbulent? What do we have to do to get it back? I, I, I don't know. I it's really been don't know. it's been a long time too, and it hasn't really done it. Uh, I'll say this: it was it was rather funny. Uh, John Odenkirk, at the uh, uh, National Park Service, built this big jetty at Dyke Marsh. I'm sure everybody knows it's a thousand foot jetty. It comes out and it curls to the north, and the uh, the theory behind that, that whole area used to be a, a sand and gravel quarry, and it was excavated uh, by smooth uh, gravel in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And because of the excavation, it uh, compromised the shoreline, and it basically eroded, and the National Park Service wanted to spend tens of millions of dollars to build this jetty so that it would replenish the marsh. And that's like, you know, a thousand years from now, it'll probably happen. But during one of those little trips, they're out there and they had a, a, a little boat and they were showing the area that they were going to be trying to replenish. And they showed the little birdies and everything else. And I love little birdies. Don't get me wrong. I just don't know what they are. They, to me, they're all little birdies. So they, they were showing these reporters and a reporter looked in the water and went, what's that? And they went, that's hydrilla. Ugh. It rhymes with Godzilla. Ugh, it's horrible. It's horrible. And the Virginia biologist said that was on the boat said, well, no, you see, it provides habitat. It's also a pioneer grass. As Thomas was saying, when some other grasses won't grow, by the time June rolls around, Hydrilla goes, we're awake. And, they and it takes over because it, it needs the clear water, but it starts to emerge a little later than milfoil. Milfoil starts to emerge mm -hmm. and green up in February, um, you know, whereas hydrilla starts to grow in, in uh, you know, May, June, and it starts to come up. So while we don't like it as boaters and homeowners and even fishing hydrilla, fishing hydrilla is really, really tough, mm -hmm. but it's good for the fishery. Yeah, and we got a couple of co comments here about this, which is awesome. We got one on Instagram. We'll start with it's jo Josh. I'm gonna try this. It's a Joshua Taurus 2886. When I first moved down here, Potomac was predominantly milfoil. Now it's way more hydrilla, and just recently started to see a, re a resurgence of uh, milfoil. Yeah, it's interesting, and this is my issue with the whole how they want to solve the issue. Hydrilla and milfoil will sometimes grow in the same area, and you can't target kill one or the other. And so when you get these organizations or governments like the the like the Army Corps of Engineers on Kerr, 
if you're going to kill Hydrilla, you will end up killing the native one that you like. And so that's where I think there has to be adjustment in how they go about it because it's a scorched earth policy that doesn't work. Uh, Brandon has one question to piggyback onto that one. Brandon, how? You talk about the possibility of the Patreon stocking program. Is there anything similar to that for grass? That's I'm glad you mentioned that, Brandon. So you guys know Patreon, when we hit 600 Patreon supporters, we have our nonprofit. We're going to have our nonprofit ready to go to do supplemental stocking. I would love to do something with that with SAV. I just don't know how because that's something I've asked so many people and it's so hard to get grass to grow. If if you're in the comment section, you know how, please get a hold of me. Uh, I would like to have you on the show because it's hard. It's really hard. Let's see. We've got a couple more yeah, questions. If you want to understand too, because it's an invasive uh, you, that's why they, the DC planted star grass because it's, it's a native grass and they're able to plant it. Milfoil and hydrilla are invasives. And I don't think you could ever get a permit to, to plant those. And at a loss for remembering the lady's name who knows more about SAVs than anybody on the planet. I know you tried to have her on your show, but, uh, you know, they understand the, the, the value of, of the plants. I just don't know that there's anything you can really do. Obviously, trying to plant the star grass was probably a good idea because it would add cover. It didn't clear the water as much as some of the other grasses that we had, but it did provide habitat, and that's the bottom line. And we got a couple of actually fishing questions here. We've got Adrena fishing. Fish uh, I know, right? Like fishing questions. That's crazy. Wow. Um, we got we got back-to-backers here. So Adrian Fishing, um, how uh, with how well the grass down south that is yeah. How about the grass down south that is coming up that is like crinkle fries? Is that the way I is is the way I can describe it? Another question is how do you fish the grass this time of year? And that is from Jake in two thirty seven on Instagram. Oh wow, Jake, this this is my favorite time to, to fish. Uh primarily two baits, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. I think probably about twenty baits. <laughs> but, uh, but uh a shallow diving crankbait, baby one minus, man's baby one minus, fire tiger. If you only have one color fire tiger, if you have two colors, get the red. Okay, so that'll that'll get you covered there. Same thing with lipless crankbaits, rattle trap, whatever. Uh, red, uh, and then maybe chrome with a blue or black back. You know, and the way I fish these, I want to contact the grass. So I'm using a, a cranking rod, but it's a medium heavy cranking rod. So it's got a little bit more backbone to it. I still, I, I go back and forth between fluorocarbon and, uh, and copoly. I use the gamma fishing lines and, and the fluorocarbon's great. You can really snap that bait out, out of the grass, but sometimes it doesn't have enough stretch. So you, you, you get a little treble hook in a fish and it might pull it out. So you contact the grass. I, the copoly line will work really good. Put a, as soon as you contact the grass, a little bit of slack and a snap. And what that does is it pulls the bait free from the grass and it pauses it. And that, you know, I always say, I always, when I do seminars, I ask everybody, so how many of you guys have cats, play with cats? And every guy, oh, not me, man, I'm a man, I don't play a cat, are you kidding me? But if you play with a cat, you'll learn. Sometimes they don't want to play, and you have to trigger them to get them to play. That's what happens when you try to, to fish around grass. You've got to trigger that fish to bite. That fish is looking for, for bait to go across the tops, of the tops of that grass. They're down there looking for it. You just have to trigger them. You catch the grass, a little bit of slack, snap it out of there with the baby one minus and with the, the lipless or the rattle traps. I also like quarter ounce spinner baits because that allows me to go a, a little bit deeper into that grass. It doesn't quite get hung up as much. If I can't get the fish to come up and eat those two other baits, I'll go, I'll go with the spinner bait. And then, of course, the chatter bait kind of fits that 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 uh, profile as well, where you're going through there. Uh, colors for the spinner bait and the chatter bait. Spinner bait usually white with gold blades. Indiana, Colorado. Uh, with the chatter bait, I like several colors, but my favorite color usually, uh, if the water is not totally muddy, I will go with uh, a crawfish type of pattern, uh, the brown and green, that kind of thing. But uh, I know that Z-Man has, I think, the best color combination for, I don't know what they call it, Red Craw or something like that, and a bait called a Mini Max. That, that bait, the, head, the blade is a little bit smaller, so, I mean, you could crawl it right through grass. Uh, swim jigs, other good thing to use. But 
don't be afraid of the grass. I, I, I've run across so many people. Oh, there's too much grass. I mean, Takahiro Omori was on the too much grass. No bass. No bass. I got another Taki. You got to fish the grass. You know, you put your bait in there, snap it out. Uh, and once you do that, you'll, you'll trigger the fish. And this is a really good time because the fish are wanting to be shallow and they want to be where that grass is. So uh, at a high tide, you can fish kind of closer to the bank on the inside edge of the grass as the tide starts to come out fish the outer edge and the deeper part of the grass we got a we got a couple more great freaking questions here um oh good because so, all the questions before have just been yeah I, I know right uh i think this is adrian i'm gonna have to cut you off but you have so many questions steve you're tied to a chair you can you have to use a soft plastic bait to throw on the river to catch one fish your life depends on it what would it be besides a senko <laughs> a tube a tube, a uh, four inch tube, Texas rig uh, with like a 316 sounds weight. I really like them. And there's one color I like in particular. And we're not going to tell our, all of our secrets on one show, are we? Oh, Don't. no, absolutely not. Okay. It's called River Craw by Mismo. And it's basically green pumpkin. And when they make a tube, they dip first in orange, bright orange. And then the last couple of dips are with green pumpkin. So when it flares, you see the, the bright orange. Orange, you know, if you look at crawfish, uh, you'll see that they have orange. Some of them have red, but they'll have orange on them this time of the year. So that would be it. Four inch Mismo tube, Texas rig with a three odd hook and a three sixteen sound weight. And usually on, at this time of year, 12 pound test, I beef it up a little bit as the grass gets thicker. But great bait to use. Of course, there are a lot of creature baits. The baby brush hog is a really good one to throw. Um, you can throw those in a variety of colors. Uh, you know, the, basically the darker the water, you want to go with the darker color. And that's black. And then you know, a little lighter might be green pumpkin and then watermelon. And if you, and I have, if you ask any of the pros, the colors they use all across the country, any time of the year, it's basically a black, which could be blue, could be purple. It's a, a green pumpkin or a watermelon. Those are the three food groups they, they target and they seem to work real well. The river is so big. And so when you go from Occoquan all the way up to DC, it generally seems ever since I started this podcast, you talk about tournament winners. It seems like Occoquan area or the lower river usually turns on first. And then as the year progresses, more and more places coming into play. This could just be anecdotal. It could just be, a, I see it. Is that have to do with water temperature and just because that's further South? If, if I that think it's because thing? people are, people are tired of fishing in crowds. Think about it. all those places that you mentioned, they, they get hammered every weekend. And if you talk to, you know, and I've talked to the pros for years about this, <clears throat> they, they want to find places where they, where they can find fish that are replenishing and they, they, all they want is five good bites a day and they want to fish those areas. Uh, it's hard to find those areas because guys haven't been fishing them because there's no grass up there. So no one's, you know, when you get, when you fish a grass bed, you go like, Oh, what's that over there? That's, that looks like an old dock. I think I'm going to go over there and try that and then come back to my grass. Now, because people haven't been going up to fish those, that, those grass beds, nobody really remembers the docks. They don't, you know, Fritz, maybe Yellis, uh, Clun, uh, those are three guys that have fished a lot up north. Uh, and they know, they know little things. They, you know, Washington Channel out in front of that statue. You go here or there, and boom, right there at the 10-foot drop, there's a piece of a barge there or uh, off of uh, South Point in, in, in Smoot Bay. There's, there's a couple of barges that are still left over there. And, you know, and, and you start fishing that, that hard cover. And I think that's really that, – that's, that's what a lot of the guys end up doing later in the year because the other spots are just flat out beaten up trolling motor noise uh you know electronics noise and and they do get affected by that the fish get affected by that and you can't go in there and make any noise um i i case in point um and i'll probably remember his name a little bit later uh, vic vadalero was fishing in flw and he was fishing in a grass bed that had about 40 boats in it he had his power poles down and he was making the same cast with his senko same cast all day long well I said, Vic, why did that work so well? He's first place after the after the first day. He said, Well, everybody else is driving around. Their electronics, their trolling motors, they were hurting mm -hmm. all the fish into my quiet zone. And that worked for day one, day two, but day three, when they were down to the, like top ten, he went from first to tenth. Why? There wasn't anybody there making noise. You know, he had, he had to find the fish because they were now moving around a little bit more. So. 
long answer to your short question. I think a lot of people are, are, are starting to, to fish up north in the fall, uh, late summer uh, to get away from the crowds because they're really there are on there. No more secrets about the grass beds by the time, you know, August rolls around. Everybody knows where they've all where everybody's been fishing, where the tournaments have been won. And uh, and they don't they don't want to go there. And then we got we got your boy here, David Smith. Uh, he's won a little All bit right, of money. David. Yeah, yeah. David's won a little bit of money on the river. I, I just a side story. We uh, Steve and I went to uh, Charlie Taylor's banquet, and it was funny. It's like every time it's like, and big fish for this tournament. And then Dave stood up, went David up there, Smith, got an award, David. came back down, Wait, and then the he next tournament, various trophies. <laughs> yeah, Steve, I need a hand. And everyone else is like breaking down, putting the food away, and all the chairs and everything. Dave's like, can you help me with all these trophies? Can you help me? <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was a great night. But uh, plenty of grass on the river right now. A couple of creeks around Aquan on both sides of the river are loaded. That is good to hear. I think we had a but That's only half the river. It's not even half the river. So every fisherman is crammed into all yeah. these, these spots. And again, I, as a guide, I had a choice. I could either, you know, start launching at Leesylvania and, and taking people for a 20, 30 minute boat ride, you know, across the river, back and forth. Or I could launch out of Bell Haven and in five minutes we're catching fish, you know, and I didn't have to, I didn't have to go, uh, I didn't have to get on on plane. I could just idle mm-hmm. over to the spots that I, you know, the cover and structure spots that I like. It makes the most sense. It really does. And that kind of t- piggybacks on Brandon's question. How's the grass in Pohick Bay? Uh, Pohick is starting to come up and it's, it's not really that from what I, what I've seen so far and what I've been talking to, to John Sisson, Captain John Sisson, uh, who's, uh, I work with, um, not as good as we'd like to see it, but we are catching some fish in there. Does it seem like the grass kill, if we could call it that, maybe that's a little too harsh. Is it creeping down river? And where do you think like that line would be where it's like the above it grass is really rare? Pohick. Pohick. Oof, that's yep. getting real close. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, anything above Pohick, there's just, you know, you're, you're not going to find a lot of grass. Uh, even Little Hunting Creek doesn't have any grass. Uh, Doug, uh, surprisingly, uh, doesn't have as much grass as it should, and it's below, it's below Pohick. But, uh, um, and I don't know, I don't know that it's, it's going to come back. When you say grass being killed, a lot of it's being dredged up by hull saners. You know, when we talked about that, that mm-hmm. very fragile, you know, milfoil having to reach the surface so that it could survive until the water gets clearer in May and June, it's also clearing the water around it. Well, if it's getting dragged up and ripped up, the good news is that it'll drift away somewhere and maybe propagate because that's how the milfoil is spread. Um, but the bad news is that it's it's not clearing the water in that area and will eventually you know die. I've seen I've seen milfoil in a matter of two weeks completely disappear. Lush beds, you know, in in March, April, and by the time June comes around, every week uh, it it started to die out and we had less and less grass. Yeah, I guess to me then with what you said, the canary in the coal mine would be next year if we see an issue with Aquaquan bay in that area like if that doesn't have grass it, it is creeping down and and why the hell is that happening um i don't know that's interesting well there's no i said from the beginning the big filter is gone the yeah. filter that was above and below the bridge i mean that you know someone asked me today when is the river going to return to normal well if there was an ample amount of grass above the bridge and below the bridge on that little stretch right there then I'd say it probably would take three or four days. I think it could take at least a week for the water to get back to a, a, a you know fairly clear level, maybe even longer up north, down south, where, the, where you do have heavy grass, it could clean up relatively quickly, but not like it used to. I mean, you're getting, instead of filtered water, you're getting muddy water that goes down to those grass beds. Let's see. We got Chris Johnson's got a really good one here. Uh, seen that in Chickamauxon and Occoquan Bay last year. Uh, hey, Captain Steve Johnson. Hey, dude, how was your tournament? I think you said you had a big tournament that you're in. I think it was the Smith Mountain Lake BFL, right, boss? I think, yeah, I think he was at Smith Smith Mountain this week. He'll yeah, look correctly. It, it is I, I tell you what, if you guys want to go with a guy who can catch anything that swims, Chris Johnson is a great guy. He's fully licensed. He does Lake Anna. He does saltwater. He does freshwater. He does towing. I mean, uh, and I've known Chris forever, and he uh, he's a he's a good guy, and you'll have a good time. And um, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what you want to fish for. He'll he'll go out there and make sure you catch him. 
Okay. Adrian Fishing it? on Instagram. Okay. Let's ask the elephant in the room big question. Steve, can yeah. I win in Nanjamoin? And this is Adrian Fishing. <laughs> no. Okay. So what's the next question? I, I don't, you know, Nanjamoin without grass is, is, uh, is very barren. Um, you know, with the saltwater intrusion in there, you, you've got to ha you have more grass than, than you ever would want. When Skeet Reese went back in there and, and won a Bassmaster event, uh, he was fishing wood. And it's four days. In grass, right? It, wood in grass. And mm. there is still wood back there, but there's no grass. So, um, he, you know, he was positioning himself with the current to get these fish to come out of that grass along these pieces of wood that creates like a little eddy behind him and a little bit of shelf underneath it um that's a long way to go that's a long way to go to to try to go fishing when you can go right across the river to a quiet creek and and do much better i think yeah because like we, we've talked about that on the show about those little sneaky spots the only time i think those sneaky spots will work is if it's like a hot summer tournament and the weights are going to be low because and you could go out there maybe a multi-day event but it's just if you're talking like the potomac teams with those hammers I don't think you're going to drive anywhere down there and catch a 20 pound bag necessarily. I could be wrong. And that's what it takes to win the Potomac teams, Ed, you know, Ed yeah. Dustin's tournaments and um, they, those guys are all very good fishermen. And, and I, and I have, I have to take my hat off to them because they knew what I did for a living and I knew what they did for, for their living recreation. And uh, we helped each other out. You know, um, I, I was not out there targeting the biggest fish in the, in the river. I was out there targeting the most fish in the river and the easiest ones to catch. And usually it wasn't around grass. So if I figured something out and I did, I figured something out about Broad Creek and I'll, I'll share it with you guys that there's no grass in Broad Creek, still some fish. Um, the barges on the south end of, of Broad Creek and the docks on the north end are very visual, obvious targets, but there are other fish in there. And at high tide, they would go up to the, to the bank and they'd spread out all along that stuff. And maybe you could pick one off, but as the tide went out, they found isolated pieces of cover. And so did I, I spent time with, I, I didn't have forward facing sonar would have made it a lot quicker. But uh, side imaging, hitting waypoints, and I put the power poles down and make cast after cast after cast to these things and to, to catch fish off of them. So, you know, there are some some things that 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 you could do in finding other places than Nanjimoy. Yeah, and, and Chris Johnson, this is a blast from the freaking past. Uh, I like this, which is Port Tobacco. Back when I fished college oh tournaments, we went down to Port Tobacco to fish, and we caught a couple. I mean, nothing worth it, but it was – yeah god i have not heard port tobacco in a long time my god oof oof yeah chris was probably in there fishing for stripers and white perch <laughs> and accidentally caught some bass and said hey i think i figured something i've never heard anybody fishing port tobacco i've seen it on my map and i'm every time i'm cruising around i go oh, look, there's port tobacco i wonder what that's all about but that's a little too far south for me it, it that's so and this is definitely a joe love conversation is, is it just the saltwater intrusion has probably gotten worse over the last 10 years because yeah you talk about ninja one pork tobacco playing back in the 90s and I, now ninja one i understand it's because they actually did a stocking program there used to be i think evening tournaments in the back of there as well to, to, to yeah. relocate them but yeah th th that is absolutely fascinating we got a fishing question here which is josh Fish. uh Joshua Torres, 2886. What size line do you use for the baby minus in the grass? Okay. So Joshua, what I, I, I basically uh, change my line through the summer in the beginning, this time of the year, I'm throwing either 10 or 12 pound test. Okay. I don't, I want to have as much action as I can with the bait, but more importantly, and I talked to Kelly Jordan about this and he didn't agree with my theory, but, uh, my theory about about line, especially when it's colder and the fish aren't really slamming your bait, is the way a bass eats a bait is they they use ram suction. So they come up right before they ram it, they open their mouth, they suck the bait in. If you're using 17 pound or 20 pound test, that's thicker line. It has more resistance in the water. So those fish that are coming up, you know, trying to to use that ram suction they they just can't get the bait in their mouth because it has a lot of resistance to it so early on before the grass gets really thick 10 12 pound test 
Then I go to 14, and that's when I really like to go with fluorocarbon because it is a it is very, very strong line. And then I'll even go to 16 pound test with the with the baby one minus. So as the grass gets really, really thick, those are the transitions that I make with line. I, I really do love, um, I, I had uh, Chris on last year and he said something that was very profound, which is like a piece of concrete's a piece of concrete and it never leaves. And that gives a lot of people advantage for that type of fishing. Um, what do you prefer if you had your druthers? Would you prefer hardcover because it's something that... Oh, yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, again, because of the business that I'm in, I, you know, I had a choice. I, I live 10 minutes from Bellhaven Marina. It's the closest marina for my clients to get to because they're all coming, you know, from that area. Uh, and so I had to make a living on it. And boy, it was so easy when I would just idle out to that big grass flat out in the middle of the river and just go, OK, throw a popper. All right. Throw a spinnerbait. OK, let, you want to keep going around because the fish are all the way around this. Well, then when that went away, I had to learn and I found areas that were very unique on the river, areas that had laydowns that came out. 30, 40 yards from the bank because it used to be land. And when the land eroded, it left tree stumps, trees laying down. So yeah, I, I, and you're fishing in three feet of water, two to three feet of water. Um, and you can throw, you can throw the one minus bounce it off stuff. The, you know, spinner bait, the same thing. Yeah, I do. And Chris nailed it, man. When that stuff is there, it's always there. And if it's not, you just add more later on when nobody's looking. It, it, that is so fascinating to me because this, this river does just completely change over time. And I, you always wonder, like, do the bass leave? Do they not? Do they have to get changed up? So, I mean, someone mentioned Belmont or Pohick Bay. It's like, so if it was grassy and then it's no longer grassy, do those fish leave? Do they feel weird? How does it take them to switch to hardcover? Uh, that, that's, I don't know. It's such a fascinating dynamic fishery. Uh, well, the fish do move around a lot. When Maryland had an active tagging program and I'd catch one, old Don Cosden was the director of fisheries. I say, hey, Don, I caught your fish. He's, you know, 13 inches. He weighs this much. I caught him here uh, and I let him go. And what can you tell me about him? Oh, well, we, we caught him six months ago and he was like, five miles down the river, 10 miles down the river. Uh, and he weighed exactly the same thing. And I'm like, okay, so we learned something from, from that kind of, uh, information. Um, but I, I, your question really, how, how, what do you, what do you really think you, you want to see for an answer with this? I mean, it, the fish will move around. They'll stay in deeper water. They'll find channels. They will migrate. Um, I want to know what happened to all the, the fish that were in that grass above and below the bridge because they used to go mm -hmm. through Fox Ferry. They would winter in the spoils. And then in the wintertime, after you know, springtime rolled around, they'd come out and they'd go all the way around that rim. They'd go out to Fox Ferry and then they'd go out to that grass. Well, then when the grass disappeared, there's still some bass but the, in, in, uh, in spoils, but it's not the way it used to be. There's still bass in there and you can still catch them because they're going to be, they have their own little fishery. So in those places, I try to find the, the little fishery within the, the bigger fishery. And it's usually a, a, a deeper spot, a Creek bend or, um, or exposed cover that you really never fished before because it was grassed in, uh, you know, longer points that you never paid attention to that, that they could be on those things, but, um, they're hard to find. And a lot of guys will go to the, you know, go back to the grass and say, Hey, bass are in the grass and I'll throw a Sanko and I'll catch them. When does, um, when does the spawn really get going here it, it, on the Potomac? Um, usually it's, it's when there, I have this one red azalea bush. And when it blooms, not when it buds, but when it blooms, that's when it is. So it's based on the length of the day, the water temperature, and the amount of sunlight that we've been getting. And that usually April, April, mid-April, sometimes it could start that early. Um, and, it, and the nice thing about the Potomac, it's a prolonged spawn. It doesn't, you don't have all this big wave stuff. You have a good wave, and then you have a continuous wave of spawners and that'll go into June. Yeah. It's really interesting here. Cause when we talk about the spawning, it usually kind of lines up with all the BFLs and, and of course, every, you know, Occoquan Bay, places like that, you know, lily pads, it, it just gets all absolutely beat to hell. 
like you said, when that time of year comes, do you try to avoid that for your, cl- I'm just thinking more of like from a client perspective, like the spawn areas. And cause I know like when I've had Billy Coles on from Smith Mountain Lake, he's like, you know, some people just don't want to catch spawning fish. So I'll go fish pre-spawn stuff. Is that kind of mindset on like a Smith Mountain Lake work on the Potomac? So no, because they're all in the same spot. Basically. Okay. I mean, you have post pre-spawn by time that's over, they're shallow post-spawn. By that time, they're still shallow. I mean, it's, you know, it's a shallow fishery. Um, and I don't think anybody really has an issue. And I, and I explained it to him this way, you know, we're not targeting spawning bass. We're fishing in an area where fish do spawn and you might catch one, but you could also catch one that's post spawn or one that's pre spawn on the same cast. And there's some areas that are exactly like that, that I, I could throw a drop shot and I could catch a spawning fish in the forefoot. And then as it drops to six, I can catch a pre-spawn. And then when it gets to eight, I can catch a post-spawn. And these are drop-off areas like around Bellhaven Cove and those areas. Guys, we're going to be uh, get a couple more questions in here because I, I don't want to keep poor Steve up all freaking night. Uh, we do have over 50 people watching, though, on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So great crowd for me starting late. Uh, let's see. You got Justin Rush. Uh, is it best fishing the new growing grass beds during the spring or hardcover during the spring? That's a, actually a decent question. That, that is, you know, um, I always try the grass always when it's when it's starting to emerge because once they move into it it's i call it musical chairs it's up to except it's in reverse so there's that limited amount of cover and all the fish are going to be there and once you find them and figure out where they are and the power poles have been one of the best things i had that tools Mm. for me because i could put the power poles down and fish an area and if i get a fish I know where that, that the fish are and we just keep casting. I just point, I, that's when I pick up my coffee and I tell my clients just keep casting over there. So yeah, bass do prefer the, the grass once they've started to move up. Now, if, if they haven't started to move up, then the hardcover, of course, uh, I'll go there, but I'm always trying both sometimes during the course of the day until we get to that point where the bass are in the grass and then I target the grass like when uh, grass used to grow in Piscataway. That that was like the way that that we used to to target them. And um, you know that what a great place to fish, right? You had mm-hmm. hardcover close by in those little islands. You had some docks if you wanted to fish those, and you had grass. So and and rocky points, gravelly bottoms, and pay attention to those points too when you see them. I I see guys. I wonder if they're looking at their electronics when they're out there. But you can see points when you go over them. They're like a ridge. Shocking, right? Connect <laughs> dots, right? But when you start catching fish in the grass, turn off your electronics. Turn them off. And don't use spot lock in a grass bed. You know, get some power poles. I mean, you're going to piss off everybody in the, in the whole bay when you start doing that. Of course, then the guys from Pennsylvania. Can I say this? The guys from Pennsylvania just start up their big motors in two feet of water and blow right through where you're fishing anyway. Bless those people. Thank you for coming to our state. We really yeah. Thank you. It. Thank you to your state for banning <laughs> fishing, so that you have to come to uh, to uh, Maryland and 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 other waters. Uh, Justin, you just want a gift card to Tiger Crankbaits? Please uh, message me uh-huh. on Instagram, Facebook, or email me fishingdv.com to reclaim your prize. We got Steve Lloyd fishing. Steve, do you think we will have a better year for grass since we had a mild winter? It appears it all hasn't. Died Died off. So should we see more growth? If you'd asked me that two weeks ago, I would have said, yeah, maybe this is the year. But with all the rain that we've had and everything that's still coming down the river, um, I know Jennings Randolph uh, is a is a lake in uh, in Maryland that uh, uh, is now finally at over full full pool and they're releasing water. And uh, so it's going to be coming down for quite some time. You could be hopeful. But as long as the water stays, this is the critical time. As long as this water stays, you know, muddy, it's it's going to be tough. Yeah, no, it 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 really is. Uh, let's see, we got where's the we got we got Brandon Price. Hey, Brandon. Steve, do you see the smallmouth population making its way further south with the lack of grass around the bridge now? Hey, Brandon, Brandon, hope you're doing well, buddy. Um, Yeah, you know, smallmouth fishing is so weird. When we get a big push of water like we are now, we usually get some smallmouth that get pushed down the river because of that. And uh, and they, you know, they're I catch them around uh, 
Bellhaven, I catch them at uh, Little Hunting Creek, Mount Vernon, uh, Doe Creek, outside of Doe Creek a little bit. Um, I, I do see them coming down, but I'm not sure if that would be because of the lack of, of grass, although that would probably physically impede them if we had those two big grass beds that you fished and I fished for, for so many years. But yeah, that's a, that, that's the kind of question that, that I could sit down with Brandon. We could probably talk about this for hours, but, uh, that's, that's a good question. I like what you think. Brandon. Uh, yeah. What the hell? You just want a gift card to, uh, Jake Spate and tackle, uh, please message me Facebook, Instagram, or email me fishing the DV at gmail.com. And you know what? I forgot to do this because uh, I was running a little bit late and I wanted to get uh, a bottle of water going from one meeting to the other. We do have a new sponsor for the Patreon program. Uh, Catoctin Roz has come on the show. So if you are a Patreon supporter, you'll also get 10% off your orders to Catoctin Roz. He's a great guy in Percival, Virginia. Um, he's We've had him on a bunch of live streams and eventually now that he has a computer that works, we'll get him on one of these shows as well. <laughs> I tell you, Mark, Mark has uh, repaired a bunch of my rods. I uh, hate to say that he's repaired that many, but uh, uh, he also uh, custom built a rod for me over the winter. We, you know, I fish a lot of silver buddies and I can't find the, the perfect silver buddy rod because it's, you, you need a rod that can handle treble hooks, number mm -hmm. six treble hooks and thin wire treble hooks. But you also sometimes need a rod where you can snap set because you're you're going to have that thump there where you know you lift it up, you drop, you feel a thump, you got to wind up and snap and set the hook. Uh, but most of the time you're just lifting up and the fish is on there, so it's got to it's got to load up really really quick. And I mean, we went back and forth over over what I was looking for and took a bunch of G Loomis rod blanks that I that I liked, and so we we built one. And I tell you what, uh, it is a super rod, and he. I tell you, the cost of custom-made rods is a lot cheaper than you think because you can buy a mass-produced rod and pay a lot more than you than you would from a local rod builder like Mark Burks. He, he does a really good job. Yeah, a hundred percent, Steve. Again, I, I don't. I feel like we've been basically on the internet right now since like four p.m. today. So, I, where can people find you? I know you're a busy man. Um, did you want to yeah. pimp it out? Yeah, I've, I've got a website and uh, what I'm really trying to do is build a YouTube audience. Um, you know, for those of you who, who know me and who have fished with me, I, I like to share everything I know and everything I figured out and everything I've stolen from the pros that I've interviewed for my articles and taken credit for for all these years. But uh, the YouTube page is National Bass Guides. Um, so on YouTube, uh, like it, subscribe to it. Uh, I also like to tinker. So I make stuff. I, I, I've, I've got a way that I've now I've made some Nico rig or Neko, depends how you say it, uh, Nico rig weights. Uh, I didn't like the ones that were out there. And, and so I actually started making some of my own and they, they work really, really well. And of course, then I can have custom colors and sizes and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm always looking for ways to help you guys save money. So uh, tune into that channel and tell your friends about it. And, and also send me suggestions if you want to, to learn a certain technique. I do on the water where I show you how I'm actually using the lure and catching fish with it, which, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, that's, that's pretty hard, isn't it? I, yeah, it is hard. You, know, where you get out there and they better be biting. So usually what happens is I'm out there and all of a sudden they start biting a rattle trap. I go, where's my GoPro? And I'll put it on and start catching them. But um, I do like to teach. And if you guys want to learn, you have a topic you want me to cover, let me know. No, 100%. And then as always, guys, that's linked in the episode description down below. Now, for these Monday Night Lives, this is how it works. Uh, basically, in about an hour, this thing will be taken down. I'm going to polish up the audio, and it's going to be re-released tomorrow morning on Apple, Spotify, and, of course, YouTube. Just want to make sure everything is clean and as perfect as possible. And, of course, links to everything that Steve has talked about as well. Uh, we will figure out a time to get Steve on, and I want to get a couple more members of the Black Bass Advisory Board on, too. I've been... I've been wanting to do kind of like our own little panel thing at some point in the future since we don't meet till July just to get there's some really cool dudes on there that I want to have on the show so badly. Yeah, Scott Sewell. Uh, and Scott. You, gotta get oh. Scott, you know, if you guys don't if you don't know anything about why we're able to do a lot of things that we do, Scott Sewell. There's only one Scott Sewell. And apparently there uh, there's other ones out there that are 10 to 15 years short on experience uh, compared to Scott. But uh He's, he's the guy. He, he really cares about fishing. He's a great guy. And uh, he used to be a state trooper, and he fixed a few tickets for me. So I think we get along really well because of that. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, guys. As always, like and subscribe really helps out in the algorithm. If you would like to, go check us out on Patreon. I have our five-year plan up there. Eventually, we're going to be starting our own nonprofit to help with uh, supplemental stocking, habitat restoration, and so many more things because it's nice is it'll be Patreon-driven. You guys have to vote on the topics, you know, not the state, nobody else. It's the people of this area that get to pick what we put the money to. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.